Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to have everybody in this afternoon. I just rehearsed with the crowd here. This is the most we've ever had. That camera is just here and gone all the way to the back. But anyway, for those of you joining us on television, we just want to welcome you to an informal Bible study. We try to keep it simple, and yet we don't want to oversimplify. And uh, again, I would like to take this opportunity. I can't answer every letter. I try to answer those with questions, but all your good letters... How I wish I could answer them, but I can't, so I have to take this opportunity. Thank you, thank you for your kind remarks and for your encouragement and uh, letting us know that the Word is indeed changing hearts and lives uh, across the country. And uh, again, we want to thank you for your financial help. Now, in spite of all the financial crunch that has gone through, we're still having without any drop. We had the biggest month ever last month, and all I can do is say, praise the Lord and uh, because we realize a lot of people are going through some hard financial times all right we're going to uh, keep right on in our study in the psalms today and uh, we've had a lot of requests for this over the years when are you ever going to teach something from psalms so that's one reason i'm doing it and uh, yet i do feel that it's what the lord would have us do and so as we always do when we look at the old testament we always have to remember that the whole picture was first the suffering, and then the what? The glory that should follow. All right, Peter puts it so perfectly then in his little epistle. First Peter, chapter 1, and I would like to just start with 9. Now, we've been doing this at the beginning of almost every taping session, so uh, I'm getting old, but I'm not senile. I do this on purpose. <laughs> I want to just drill this in, and maybe after a period of time, you'll actually know it from memory, because that's how memory works. If you repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, pretty soon you don't even have to read it. You've got it. All right, First Peter, chapter 1, starting at verse 9. Now, remember, who is Peter read, writing to? Fellow Jews, believing Jews. Well, not the believers of the age of grace. They're believers in the what? The kingdom gospel, that Jesus was the Christ. They're still under the law. Nobody has told those Jews to stop temple worship. The temple is still operating. It's not 70 AD yet. And so always keep that in mind, that there is not, as I taught it when we put it in the, uh, in the program years back, these little Jewish epistles do not have one word of church language. Not one word. And I don't know how these theologians can miss that. But it's a fact of life. You go through there with a, what we call a fine-tooth phone, and you will not find one reference to the body of Christ. You will find not one reference to salvation through death, burial, and resurrection. Not one. And it's all to Jews, whereas our gospel is for the Gentile. So always be aware and I've said it over and over on this program, be just as aware of what is not said in a portion as what is said. Now, Peter is addressing the 12 tribes. So he's writing to Jews under the kingdom economy. And so there's nothing here of what we learned from Paul. And so the reason I use this as a kickoff for things in the Old Testament is just that very reason. All right. First Peter chapter 1, verse 9, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation, this which rightly came out of Christ's earthly ministry now, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Now stop and think when you read something like that. What does that mean? They looked and they looked. And they studied, and they searched, and they couldn't find what they were looking for. That's what it means. And so they searched and inquired diligently. These same prophets who prophesied or foretold of the grace that should come to you at a later time, and we're going to be seeing that as we come through the Psalms again today. Now then, verse 11, searching. Now, you and I have no idea how the Jewish people, when they're in a theology situation, in a yeshiva, they will sometimes look at nothing but one verse, if I can believe what I read. One verse, maybe for weeks on end, trying to see if they can pull something up that somebody else has never seen before. 
All right, so this is what it means. They searched and they searched. They studied. And they contemplated. They meditated. See? Diligently. All right? And they're searching what matter of time, the Spirit, that is, the Holy Spirit of Christ, who was in them. Now, you've got to remember the Holy Spirit inspired every word of Scripture just as much as Paul or any of the New Testament writers. All right, so these Old Testament prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea and all the rest of them, they searched what manner of time the Holy Spirit of Christ who was in them did signify when it or he, the Holy Spirit, through his inspiration now remember, testified beforehand, before anything ever happened. See, and that's the beauty of Scripture is prophecy. So how the Holy Spirit did signify beforehand the sufferings of Christ, but it doesn't stop there. And the what? The glory which should follow. Now remember when we first started several tapings back? Go back with me now to Psalms, but we'll go back where I started. I have Psalms chapter 2, which I have used over the last 30 years of my teaching, as the outline of that Old Testament timeline. The Old Testament timeline that completely knew nothing of this age of grace, knew nothing of Paul and his apostleship. And everything was Jewish, looking forward to the time when the king and the kingdom would reach out to the Gentile world through Israel. But all right, Psalms chapter 2, and I always use this, like I said, as an outline of the Old Testament program. Verse 4, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh because of their rejecting the Messiah and killing him. And the Lord shall have them, Jews and Gentile, in derision, confusion. And then, after they've accomplished the work of the cross, they've put him to death, then he, that is the Lord, the God from heaven, shall speak unto them, that is, the, human, the humanity of the world, Jew and Gentile, he'll speak unto them in his wrath. Not grace, wrath. And he will vex them. He won't soothe them. He won't bless them. He's going to vex them in his sore, what? Displeasure. His wrath, after 6,000 years of letting man do as he wanted, is finally going to fall. And we're getting closer every day. My, how the world is getting ripe for this judgment that's coming. They don't want to hear it. See, they, they like to ridicule it. I'm some kind of a nut. I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, I got news for them. I'm not. <laughs> I do know what I'm talking about because the book is sure. All right, so he's going to vex them in his sore displeasure. But what's going to follow? Yet have I set my king the King of kings and the Lord of lords is yet going to be set upon the holy hill of Zion. And where's Mount Zion? Jerusalem. See? Jerusalem. And that's what we're going to be looking at now in the next few moments. All right, turn with me ahead then to where we left off in our last taping. We were in Psalms 41. And remember, I'm just looking at primarily what we call the Messianic Psalms. And uh, I think I can define that as any one of the Psalms that can be corresponded with a New Testament reference that it's Jesus of Nazareth that's being foretold. And so not every Psalm is, although some are still definitely messianic, but not to the point that these special ones that we picked them out. So 41 was the last of the messianic Psalms that we had, and now I'm going to jump up to number 45. Psalms 45. And before the chapter is over, we're going to see that Israel's Messiah, the Son of God, the Anointed One, the Son of God, and the one we know in the New Testament as Jesus the Christ, is going to be pictured here as the groom. See? He's going to be the groom of the bride. All right? The bridegroom. But we'll start at verse 1. And remember, it's... The groom who is speaking, these are the words of Christ as the Holy Spirit inspired David to write them, and then they become a reality at some future day. My heart is indicting or is promoting a good matter. I speak of the thing which I have made 
touching the what? The king. See? Now this is the whole concept of Old Testament prophecy is this coming king and kingdom. Now you've been hearing me for the last 20 years admonishing that this is the keynote of Old Testament prophecy, a coming king and his kingdom. But before the king could come, what did he have to do? He had to suffer. And before the king would suffer, there had to be the wrath and so forth of God's uh, judgment upon mankind. And so all the Old Testament is constantly looking forward to the suffering, which of course was the work of the cross, and then the horrors of the tribulation, and then the glory, the kingdom, which would follow. All right, back to verse 1. So my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Now that's a nice way of putting a statement, isn't it? The tongue that was on the lips of the Lord Jesus himself was as ready to go as someone getting ready to write. See? Now, I'm not a good letter writer. I am horrible, but you know why? As soon as I say, dear something, a comma, I go blank. Utterly blank. Now, some people are terrific letter writers. They can hardly wait to get past that comma, see? And I can't, because I just turn blank. But see, that's not the case here. Here, the prophet is speaking of Christ as being ready to speak forth as quickly as someone who is ready to write a letter. All right, now then, verse 2. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Well, who are we talking about? Messiah, the coming king, see? Even though it's in his own words coming through David. Now, I'm going to be repeating that all afternoon because otherwise you're going to miss it. King David is writing at what point in time historically? About when? A thousand years before Christ, see? That's when David wrote. And everything, as we're going to see from the New Testament comparisons, was spoken back there in the Psalms, was also spoken in his earthly ministry, one way or another. And so the Holy Spirit inspired David to write the actual words of the Messiah. Am I making that plain? I know that sounds like gobbledygook, but I hope it isn't. And this is the whole concept, that David is writing in the Psalms what the Messiah is actually going to speak and do at his first advent when he brings about the work of the cross. All right. So thou art fairer than the children of men. He's the Son of God. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore, God, now always keep the concept. God is the invisible triune Godhead. And God the Son is one of those three. And you know, I'm always showing it as he steps out of that invisible Godhead and became visible and so forth. All right, so what we have here then is that God the Son is still being blessed by the Godhead, which includes all three, Father, Son, and and Holy Spirit. All right, so the Godhead. Now, let me show you where I get the term. Now, I have to do this scripturally. Keep your hand in Psalms. Jump up to Colossians, chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 2. And let's just drop in at verse 8. Colossians, chapter 2, verse 8. Wait until all the pages stop turning. You know, this is what thrills me so in, in my teaching experience, that everybody has their own Bible. And, you know, we hear it from stem to stern. Why do all your people have their own Bible? Well, because they're there to study. They're not just there to kill time. And how can you study without a textbook? And so you don't know how much I appreciate the fact that you come in having your own Bible and follow with me. All right, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, beware, there's a warning, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit 
after the tradition of men, and that's most religion, remember. It's men's ideas put together, and it becomes tradition. All right, that's the warning. Don't follow vain deceit and the traditions of men after the rudiments or the, the natural things of the world, and not after Christ. See how plain that is? But there's the verse I wanted. For in him, in Christ, in the Lord Jesus of Nazareth, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the, what? The Godhead. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, but the Godhead is an invisible sphere, but what is God the Son? He's visible. And that's why I'm always putting it on the board. It's almost beyond my reach, I think. But maybe I can get something up here. Do it again. We've done it over the years. Here we have the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the Godhead. But whenever God dealt with humanity or creation or whatever, and to come down and do the work of the cross, God the Son stepped out of the invisible and became what? Visible. Tangible. See? And that's the whole teachings of Scripture. So when we see that God the Son is referring to God, don't throw the God the Son out of the God concept because it's a Godhead of all three persons. All right, now then, let's go back to Psalms 45. Now, you know, I didn't intend to do that, so that's free for nothing. Back to Psalms 45. So God hath blessed thee forever. Yes, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as the Godhead blessed God the Son. Now then, gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty, and in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness, and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Now I'm going to go on through verse 5. Thy arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. What's he referring to? The tribulation again, see? All right, now let's go back to Revelation. I've got to put all this down scripturally so that you get the full picture. And so not only is he filled with grace and mercy and truth, but oh my goodness, he's also going to be coming as the God of judgment and wrath and the punishment of the human race. Revelation chapter 19 again. And that's what all these things are putting together. And that's what we have to do. I will never stop using as many scriptures as I can. I don't care if your thumb does get tired. We're going to look at as many scriptures as possible because that's how it all comes together. All right, Revelation 19, starting at verse 11. Now, this is after the horrors of the tribulation have run their course. Armageddon is part and parcel of his second coming, of course. And uh, we were just there a few days ago, Megiddo. Quite an experience, wasn't it? To be there where this final battle is going to be fought. All right, Revelation 19. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Verse 13, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, just like John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. See? All right. And uh, verse 14, and the armies which were in heaven. Now, I've got... I've got some on-the-fence thinking here, so I'll pass on that for the time being. The armies who were in heaven followed him upon white, uh, on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Remember how Psalms put it? Thy arrows are sharp in the heart of the enemies. 
And uh, everything is referenced in verse 3. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh. See? All right, back to Revelation 19. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, which, of course, will take place as soon as he sets up that glorious kingdom. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. That's Armageddon, as we refer to it. And he hath on his vesture and on his thighs the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, you can't get any plainer than that, can you? That's Christ in his second advent. All right, now back to Psalms and see how perfectly David pictures it in his own day and time, a thousand years before. All right, again, verse 3, Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. In thy majesty ride prosperously. That makes reference to the white horse, of course because of truth and meekness and righteousness, and thy right hand shall teach thee frightening things. The word terrible is just simply that it's going to be beyond the norm. Now verse 5, this is all part of his fighting the enemy of satanic powers and the human race in general. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. All right, now I'm going to have to jump ahead. I'll probably be using the verse several times before the day is over. So bear with me. Psalms 110, verse 1. <clears throat> Psalms 110, verse 1. Now this, of course, is a reference first to his ascension when he left the Mount of Olives. You know, in, uh, in our tour in Israel last week, a lot of our people thought the Mount of Olives was the most touching place because it was from the Mount of Olives that he walked down and in on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, got a mental block. He came in through the Golden Gate on that Palm Sunday, on Palm Sunday, and then it was from the Mount of Olives, of course, that he ascended. All right, that's what made me think of it. From the Mount of Olives, he ascended and went back to glory. All right, now Psalms 110, verse 1, is the prophecy. The Lord, God the Father, Said unto my Lord, God the Son, sit thou at my right hand until, what kind of a word? Time word, that away, that away. A time word, sit at my right hand until some point in the future, a particular month, day, and year, I make thy enemies thy what? Footstool. What does that denote? They're under his feet. See? They're under his feet. When little David killed Goliath, what did he do with him? Put him under his foot, didn't he? Sure. What did he denote? Total defeat of the enemy. All right, that's what God is going to do then with Satan and the hordes of humanity who have been rebelling against him for 6,000 years. Well, we're never going to finish everything I intended to finish, but we'll go as far as we can. We'll pick it up in the next half hour. Come back then to Psalms 45. Now, after the horrors of the tribulation, when he has totally defeated the enemy and the human race has come under the judgment and the vexation of a righteous God, now we come to the proof that this is a messianic psalm. Verse 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter, or that denoting kingly power, the scepter of thy kingdom is a right or a righteous scepter. Thou lovest righteousness, you hate wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, in other words, the Father, has anointed thee, the Son, with the oil of gladness above thy fellows, in other words, above the rank and file of Israel. All right, now then, in the couple minutes we have left, I think we can do this. Go back with me to Hebrews, chapter 1. And this is what ties this in as a messianic psalm. Here we have an exact repetition in a New Testament setting. Hebrews, chapter 1. And uh, let's just drop in at verse 4. 
No, I got to jump into verse 2. I'm sorry, you guys that are getting this ready for print. Hebrews chapter 1, let's just drop in at verse 2. The God of verse 1 hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, Jesus of Nazareth, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. In other words, when we see that back there in Colossians and uh, in Paul's other epistles, that everything was consigned to the Son. All right, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made or created the worlds, who, this same God the Son, being the brightness of his glory, remember the transfiguration, and the express image of his person. In other words, he became the visible manifestation of the invisible God. And the upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sin with the work of the cross, when he had purged our sins, he sat down. That's why Psalms 110 verse 1 Come sit at my right hand, okay? And when by himself he purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, that is the angels, for unto which the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again... The scripture says, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But, here it comes now, just as we saw in Psalms 45. But unto the Son, Jesus of Nazareth, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. And here's another, word for word repeat. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, do you see how exactly it was spoken back through the pen of David, and now it comes back through the writer of the book of Hebrews? The same person, the same Son of God, the same coming King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.